A Tear in the Seams, the period from 1850 to 1860. And guys, this is a very critical part of American history. Uh, it's where everything, you know, we just completed a successful war. We have all the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. You'd think it would be a great time in America. But it turns out to be incredibly complicated. And guys, make sure you pay attention to this lecture because it's from this lecture that uh, quiz 12, the questions will be over. So first, there we go. Anti-slavery, uh, the prelude of this is the anti-slavery movement. Now, anti-slavery sentiment, despite its still kind of unpopularity, was on the increased. And the abolitionist movement was growing larger. Well, the problem with getting bigger is that not everybody can agree on everything. And some moderate abolitionists really start becoming alienated by Garrison's tactics and by his association with radical black abolitionists. I mean, by this time, Garrison began to call the U.S. Constitution a covenant with death and an agreement with hell as he burned a copy of it, saying it was little more than a compromise with tyranny. But during this time, some black abolitionists became quite prominent in the garrison wing. You had people like Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, who was very educated and eloquent. You also had women like Sojourner Truth, who even though she wasn't educated, she could hold a uh, amphitheater enthralled by her tales and uh, remembrances of slavery and its injustice. Ready to go to the next slide? Now the women's movement. Well, some of the women told Garrison, hey, while we're fighting for uh, black men to have the vote, why don't we fight for black women? I mean, for women, regardless of rape, to have the vote. And Garrison said, no, we're not going to focus on that because that's just going to weaken our movement even more. So these people split off and held the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, where the women formulated a program for equality and political rights. Angela Grimke was one of the first women to speak out for equal rights. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were also present. They were all Quakers. But notice, guys, you had ladies as well as gentlemen. And how did the Declaration of Sentiments go? Well, a little something like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they have been endowed by their God. Da, la, 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 la. Basically, the Declaration of uh, Independence with women included. Ready to go to the next one? So what's going to happen in the election of 1848? Well, the issues in the election of 1848, the two major parties tried to do everything they could to avoid the issue of slaveries in the territory. They tried to advance a policy of popular sovereignty towards the expansion of slavery. Basically, what was popular sovereignty? Popular sovereignty said, hey, let the people of the territory decide.
Well, one third party arose out of this called the Free Soil Party. Their party's slogan was free soil, free labor, free speech, and free men. They insisted that slavery be excluded from the, from the territories. Now, as you can see, one of the guys who founded this party that would kind of become a uh, basis for the later on Republican Party to be built out of, uh, Martin Van Buren started both the Democratic Party and, in a way, the Republican Party. Now, guys, maybe if we had had just a little more time, level heads could have prevailed. But gold was discovered in California in 1848 at Sutter's Fort, and thousands rushed out there. Ready to go to the next line? So we have new political uh, choices. Now guys, so many people rushed out to California that the military couldn't control it anymore. And they said, look, this place needs to have its own government and it needs to be a state. Well, California uh, was ready to become a state and it wanted to bar slavery. Now, what's this, of course, caused incredible tension. Because if you remember, according to the uh, Missouri Compromise, everything below 3630 was to be slave. Everything above it was to be free. Well, if you kept extending this line, oh, California is both on top and below it. What are we going to do? Oops. Well, uh, Taylor, who was, a, who was the president, he was a slaveholder, and many in the South thought that he wasn't going to allow it to become a free territory because even though it was just a part, it was below the 3630 compromise line. Well, he, Taylor, recommended, he said, okay, we're going to let it come in free, but Utah and New Mexico, both the Utah Territory and the New Mexico Territory, here and here, both these can decide if they want to be free or if they want to be slave. And as you can see, because of the 3630 line, New Mexico definitely would have been uh, slave states. But Utah, which was above, now it could choose if it wanted to be a slave state. And California was gonna be let in as a free state. Well, this of course causes a fervor. And what are we gonna do about slavery in Utah and New Mexico? Territories divided our nation. And Henry Clay, the guy who would come up with the Missouri Compromise, he believed he had the answer. And he developed this huge, complex omnibus bill. And probably to win uh, members of his constituency back, Taylor said that he would veto any bill that was added to Clay's compromise. And Clay puts the compromise out and it's a total flop. It goes down in failure. That is until the little giant, Stephen Douglas, a representative from Illinois, he came in with his kind of twist on what Clay had done.
Douglas took the exact same things that the omnibus bill had, but instead of having it as a huge bill, he broke it down into several bills. And that way he got the same thing passed. That would be like me as a teacher saying, okay, on um, after the final, we're going to have a class pizza. And everybody here is going to have to pay for it. And the ingredients that are going to be on it are pepperoni, Italian sausage, mushrooms, uh, green peppers, and jalapenos. And we're going to have to vote. And if y'all don't want that pie, then you're not getting anything. Well, of course, somebody in there probably wouldn't like want some of those ingredients. So they'd vote against it. And it goes down as a total failure. What Stephen Douglas did is he went in there and he said, okay, we're going to have a pizza. How many of y'all want pepperoni? And a majority of the class voted for pepperoni. How many of y'all want sausage? A majority of the class would vote for sausage. How many of y'all want mushroom? Majority of the class votes for mushroom. How many of y'all want green peppers? Majority of the class votes for that. And finally, how many of y'all want jalapenos? And that barely ekes out a majority. But it's the exact same pizza pie. And that's how Stephen Douglas was able to get it passed. And what do we call the huge thing that Henry Clay had come up with? It was the Compromise of 1850. And in the Compromise of 1850, California was going to be admitted as a free state popular sovereignty, or once again letting the states decide, or the territories themselves decide, would be used to determine whether Utah and New Mexico territories would have slavery, and to placate or to make happy the South, they included the fugitive slave law that basically said now bounty hunters can cross into the north and retrieve back runaway slaves and the slave trade was banned in Washington DC Now guys, remember, we have compromises where you give away something, but you get something else, something else out of it. Both sides are supposed to walk away happy. Guys, this does not happen at all. I'll go back real quick. The reason why it doesn't happen is because the North felt they had lost everything because of the fugitive slave law whereas the south uh, felt cheated because with California added there were more free states than there were uh, slave states and they lost the balance in Congress or in the Senate ready to go to the next slide Meanwhile, the Whig Party, well, it collapses. Conscience Whigs or anti-slavery Whigs and Cotton Whigs or pro-slavery Whigs totally divided the party. There was also animosity as to how uh, Catholics or immigrants should be dealt with and Protestants the native-born American that further splits the party. And guys, if we had had the Civil War in 1850, 
uh, because of that compromise, the South might have fared a lot better. But in the North, things really start to explode during the 1850s. I mean, you have steam power, advanced interchangeable parts, the beginning of assembly lines, first developed by Isaac Stinger, and mass production all combined to a huge expansion of the factory industry. Indeed, by 1860, less than half of those who lived in the North made their living from agriculture anymore. They're going industrial big time. Meanwhile, you have the railroad that's moving to the economic center and uh, center place in the economy. During this decade, railroad mileage more than tripled from 9,000 miles to 30,000 miles. And by 1852, Chicago is connected by rail uh, at our first north-south line that goes from Chicago down to New Orleans and it's connected to the markets of the East, making it a main transportation hub by 1855. And now that we have all this dependable transportation going on, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing, are all expanded. Even further into the interior. Now don't get me wrong, there were difficulties faced. Like the lack of a standard rail gauge. Remember, a gauge is the distance between the um, rails on the railroad. And this made it so that if ever, like, if I owned a railroad line that went from Dallas to Austin, and then somebody else owned a railroad line that went from Austin to San Antonio, well, I'd want to use a different gauge than their rail line. And I might have my station on the north side of town, whereas the other rail line that went down to uh, San Antonio would be on the other side of town and I'd have to unload all of the freight at the northern train station, have it hauled down to the southern train station and reloaded, which really slowed things down. Also, there had to be more bridges being built to support the railroads. But luckily, at all levels, governments helped out to expand the railways. Now, why would the government uh, help by giving these uh, railways like land, uh, giving them loans, uh, maybe even money out directly? Well, guys... Why do you think Plano gave all that land to Toyota to move their world headquarters here? Toyota doesn't even have to pay taxes for seven years from when they first founded here. Not only that, but Plano and Texas promised to build them um, rail lines and transportation hubs. Now, why did Toyota get such a sweet deal? Well, guys, this is the world headquarters. And while Toyota may not have to pay taxes, everybody they hire do. And those people that they hire, 
A lot of them are going to be coming in from out of state. They're going to need a place to live. So that's going to help out the apartment people. That's also going to increase the value of the homes, which means property taxes are going to go up, meaning Plano's going to be making more money. And not only that, but the people that move here that are taking these jobs, that are getting taxed, they're going to have to buy food, they're going to have to buy gas, they want to go see movies, they want to go buy some clothes. Basically, opportunity creates opportunity. And that's why the government was helping out with the funding of the railroads. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay. Meanwhile, we have the West, whose economic and political power is on the increase. You had world grain prices that were on the rise throughout the 1850s, combined with new farming equipment that made greater production possible. The labor force is also expanding thanks to immigration. And once again, the main immigrant groups are the Irish and the German. They're both increasing. So you have the American system with the South doing the cotton, the North doing the industrial goods, and the West doing the food are all doing great, but they all have different economies. And more and more, this is contributing to sectional division, where slavery seemed to loom behind every issue and debate. Now, the decline of the Whigs. The Whig Party is weakening because its effort to attract immigrants angered American artisans, you know, the craftsmen, because supposedly all the immigrants were flooding the factory system, and the evangelical Protestants, because most of these immigrants coming in were Catholic. So what happens? Well, a large faction splits off and forms the American Party. These guys are also known as the Know Nothings. K-N-O-W, nothing. How do they get that name, Know Nothing? Because after every political meeting they had, when they'd get up to walk out, they were told, don't tell the reporters anything. So the reporters would ask them, hey, what'd y'all talk about in there? And they would respond, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know anything. Oh, I know nothing, eh? <laughs> Basically, they were anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, but the reasons why they were differed from region to region. Like Northern Know Nothings believed that Southern slaveholders and Catholic agents were conspiring to destroy liberal republicanism and free enterprise. Southern Know Nothings believed that immigrants who had fled oppression in Europe would automatically support reform movements, including uh, including um, the abolishment of slavery, abolitionism. Here you can see some of their propaganda. Native Americans beware of foreign influence. 
Here's one where it's a it's a ship filled with poor. The poor house from Galway. That's the Irish spelling of my name. Um, and down here it says at the bottom, the balance of trade with Britain uh, still is still against us because all their poor are coming over here. And then over here you have Irish whiskey. That's supposed to be an Irish immigrant. And lager beer. That's the German immigrant that's uh, sneaking away with the ballot box while all the, all the Americans are fighting amongst themselves back over here. Ready for the next line? Meanwhile, during this uh, time, you also have the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin that really gave a new impetus to the anti-slavery movement. Harriet Beecher Stowe was the author that portrayed the darkest humanities of slavery. Basically, she took uh, tales she had heard of runaway slaves and she did visit one slave state Kentucky but didn't really talk to any of the uh, slaves even though it was a powerful indictment of slavery at first it was published in serial form in like newspapers where like a chapter or a few pages would be published bi-weekly or every other week. And it was published as a novel in 1852. And that first year it only sold 3,000 copies. But when people found out about it, they started buying it like crazy. And within its first five years, it sold 500,000 or half a million copies. Just in the U.S. Because it did sell in other places in the world. Indeed, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, was the uh, daughter of an uh, abolitionist. Uh, she was very short. She was only like 4'8". And she met Abraham Lincoln, who was six foot, he was either 6 foot 2 or 6 foot 4. And when he met her in the White House uh, and the Civil War's raging, he commented, hey, so you're the little lady that started this big war. Ready to go to the next line? Meanwhile, uh, in defiance of the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, people in the North built the Underground Railroad that basically would take uh, escaped slaves and if they're up here in the North, they'd ferret them out where basically they'd travel during the night from safe house to safe house and in the north they'd try and get them up here to Canada or if you were in Texas because it's so far away they tried to uh, get them down to uh, Mexico and this is where we get the case of Harriet Tubman who was born sometime in Maryland in either 1820 or 1821 we're not really sure she was forced to work at the age of five, but she was a very headstrong individual. And at the age of 13, she had a head injury, which caused her blackouts throughout her life. In 1844, Harriet married John Tubman, a free black man. And after the death, of the plantation owner 
uh, she was going to make a break for it. She said to her husband, hey, come with me. He said no. So she made her way on foot to Pennsylvania, about 90 miles away. And she worked for two years saving some money so she could return to uh, Maryland and get her sister and her kids. And she goes back and she knocks on the door and who should answer it but the new Miss Tubman. Her uh, husband had remarried. Well, regardless, she undertook many regular trips, all at the risk of her life. She was a shrewd planner that took a different route eat, and used disguises to avoid getting caught. Awards totaling $40,000 were put up for her arrest, but she was never caught. Indeed, she got to be so valuable to the abolitionist movement, they made her stop going south to uh, get more fugitive slaves. And during the Civil War, Harriet worked as a nurse and a scout for the North. Ultimately, she led about 300 people to freedom in Canada. And she continued to serve her people by establishing a home for the elderly in upstate New York. And what did she get for all of the great things she did during her life? Well, she died in total and complete poverty. poverty in 1915 at a home in upstate New York for the indigent. But she truly was, uh, has an incredible story. Now during this time also you had temperance reformers that also left the Whig party and went to the know-nothings because the popular belief among the know-nothings was that the immigrants were the ones that were doing all the drinking and doing bad things. So they passed laws, uh, the 13 states passed laws prohibiting the sale and manufacture of liquor. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, growing tension under Pierce. Now guys, we had the north-south route um, from Louisiana to Chicago, but now we wanted to build a east-west route. And were they gonna build this east-west route through uh, the north or through the south? Well, a lot of people got scared because of something called the Gasden Purchase. What was the Gasden Purchase? Let me show you real quick. Got to go back up, up, uh. Well, that's what the boundary of New Mexico and Arizona used to look like. The Gasden Purchase is right here. It's about 29,600 square miles of land that we paid Mexico 10 million bucks just for this land because it had the easiest routes through the mountains that would be easiest for the railroad. Now let's get back to our, oh, I'm going back, get back to where we were. Now because they built, I mean, because they bought the Gasden purchase, that scared a lot of people that, oh my God, it's going to go through the South. So good old Senator Stephen Douglas of um, Illinois, he, he uh, wanted one that was went through the North and one that went through Chicago. So in order to get the support to get this Northern route, he said, okay, 
we have popular sovereignty in Utah and the New Mexico Territory. And now if you make the northern route go through Chicago, I'm going to get the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed which basically will say now Nebraska through popular sovereignty and Kansas through popular sovereignty can decide if they want to be slave or if they want to be free. And if Kansas was a slave state and Nebraska would be a a free state, then congressional balance could be maintained. So did it bring everybody together? The exact opposite. A house divided. Ready for the next slide? The Kansas-Nebraska Act infuriated opinion in the North. A shattered compromise. Northern coalitions to defeat it didn't succeed, but instead they coalesced to form the Republican Party. And now you have Northerners openly threatening non-compliance with the Fugitive Slave Act. Now why was the North so sensitive about this? Well the North saw this and totally believed It was part of a slave power conspiracy to take away and limit the freedoms. I mean, there were filibustering by Southerners or filibustering expeditions that had been sent out in the Caribbean and in Central America, like William Walker. There he is right there. He uh, tried a coup in Baja, California, that little strip of land underneath California, that's Baja, California. Back in 1854, the next year in 1855, he leads an expeditionary force, is able to take over all of Nicaragua, and Pierce ex- grants diplomatic recognition to Walker's regime. Now, guys, why would the North be freaked out if um, the U.S extended recognition to a new nation that owned slaves. Well, guys, it had just annexed Texas that had fought for and won its own independence, and it was a slave country, and it had just been annexed. Not only that, but the Austin Manifesto had been issued by Washington, D.C., saying, oh, by the way, just to let everybody know, we can take over Cuba by force if we want to. Well, guys, the, to the people of the North, why are you going to take over Cuba unless you want more slave states? All right, ready to go to the next slide? Meanwhile, I'm bleeding Kansas. Guys, as you have more and more people rushing into Kansas to get it to to be a slave, uh, slave territory or a free territory, you have northern ministers like Eli Thayer who organized the New England Immigrant Aid Society to get anti-slavery people to move to Kansas. And you had northern ministers that were collecting funds to purchase rifles, ammo.
once they get out there. So you had pro-slavery forces entering Kansas from Missouri, which is a lot closer. They vote illegally in the elections, giving slavery interests a deafening voice in the legislature. Indeed, as much as 60% of the votes that had been cast were illegal. Well, if you're anti-slavery, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go out and uh, build your own capital. That's the free capital of the territory. The anti-slavery capital. in Lawrence, Kansas. Ready for the next one? Oh, and what happens to Lawrence, the free capital that they built up? Well, a group of pro-slavery people that included Frank and Jesse James uh, basically go out and they destroy the town. Well, not everybody is the biggest fan of this. For example, Joe Brown. Joe Brown was a guy who had gone through, uh, I believe, two marriages. He'd lost like about five businesses. Uh, He believed that God had told him that he had to go to Kansas and make sure that it stayed a free state. Well, what does he do? He goes out with his sons and he guns down and murders five pro slave Now, he didn't murder them. His sons did. They murder five pro-slavery men near Pottawatomie Creek. Later on, when he was questioned why he murdered them, instead of um, doing an honorable thing and asking him for a duel, Brown replied, one duels with gentlemen, one beats dogs. And guys, this fighting and violence isn't just limited to Kansas. Indeed, you have this violence breaking out in Congress. Oops. Okay, like I was telling you guys, this actually breaks out to actual violence in Congress when they had a joint resolution and Senator Sumner of Massachusetts was up giving a speech where he was really hitting hard uh, against slavery and the slave states and Sumner by this time was a pretty old guy and throughout his political career he had fought for the rights of African Americans. Well, Representative Brooks, a first year uh, representative, is listening to Sumner's speech and his, the knuckles on his cane are getting white. Uh, he's just so filled with rage when suddenly he leaps up, he bashes Sumner over the head with his cane, breaking it and beats Senator Sumner so severely, it takes him more than three years to recover. Ready for the next slide? So what are the results of this? Well, the results is both uh, Sumner 
and Brooks become heroes to their sides. Like uh, Sumner, he was promptly reelected. Uh, Brooks, he goes into his office the next day. Uh, he was from South Carolina, and he sees this long box on his desk, and the note on top of the um, ribbon says, from your grateful constituents. He opens it up, and it's a solid gold cane. Ready for the next slide? So in the election, the Republican Party, especially for a first time go out in 1856, did kind of well. It's relatively narrow defeat underscored the new party's appeal in the North. The American party, it just totally collapsed over the issue of slavery and many of its northern members just left and joined the Republican Party. So on March 4th, 1857, James Buchanan becomes our president. He was a 65-year-old Pennsylvania man and the nation needed a strong leader, which I'm sure he wanted to be, and he wanted to national he wanted national unity, but he just wasn't able to provide it. By this time, regionalism is coloring every issue. Ready to go to the next slide? All right, bringing slavery home to the North. The Dred Scott case. Now, Dred Scott was a slave who had been born in Virginia around 1800. His owner moved to St. Louis in 1830, where Scott was sold to John Emberton a U.S. Army surgeon. And so they're in Missouri, which is a slave state. But in 1836, Emerson and Scott moved to Fort Snelling, an Army uh, post in modern-day Minnesota. And that was a territory that had banned slavery. And in 1837, Emerson left Fort Snelling uh, to come back near St. Louis. And in 1846, Emerson died. While um, Emerson's wife was going to give freedom to Scott and his wife but uh, his wife Harriet, but Scott said, no, I want to take this to trial because I was held a slave in a free territory and that shouldn't happen. So this case goes all the way before the Supreme Court of the United States where it was ruled that um, Congress had no right to, uh, to limit slavery in the territories. Basically, they ruled that Dred Scott was nothing more than property. And property is property is property wherever you owned it. And this uh, ruling has been considered a terrible ruling. And in America, it converted more people to the Republican Party than uh, all the abolitionists put together. Ready for the next slide?
Meanwhile, out in Kansas, the pro-slavery Lee Compton Constitution kept tensions high. And of course, Congress doesn't approve it because so many non-residents had participated in the ratification vote. By the time a second ratification vote was ready to be taken, you had more free soilers that had been able to move all the way out there. So that was defeated. Meanwhile, in Illinois, we have uh, debates going on uh, on who's going to be the senator. Abraham Lincoln ran against Stephen uh, Douglas for the Senate. And they get in, involved into a series of debates about the expansion of slavery. Basically, Lincoln believed that if slavery would, was not allowed to expand, it would die out. If slavery stopped right now, and basically you only have more free states that were growing, it would be like a cancer, and that it couldn't grow, and the other states that were free would pass laws, making it more and more difficult to have slaves. Meanwhile, Stephen Douglas, guys, uh, said the Freeport Doctrine. What's the Freeport Doctrine? Nothing more than popular sovereignty. It's just like uh, the Chesapeake and tobacco. I say Stephen Douglas, you say popular sovereignty. Stephen Douglas, popular sovereignty. Stephen Douglas, popular sovereignty. That's where you let the people of the territory or the state decide. And what did the crowd think? Well, the crowd thought that Douglas won. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, radical responses to abolitionism and slavery. Guys, more and more the Southerners started to defend slavery's expansion as vital to their economic and political well-being. Now, how are you going to defend slavery? Well, they defended it by saying, you know, hey, look, uh, we're bringing them religion. We're teaching them about God. They'd also point out that uh, it was biblical. In the Bible, slavery is there. They actually used to say that it, the whites were actually because southern whites knew what it was like to have slaves and have rights restricted that the slave owners were freer and more cultivated. And they also pointed out that, hey, look, slave labor is much more humane than the wage labor of the north. Here's a deal where it says slavery as it exists in America, slavery as it exists in England. Here everybody's happy, oh, dancing around, and masters are just sitting back there talking about what good slaves they are. Meanwhile, down here, the rich guy won't give the beggar any money. These urchins are with clothes that are rather falling off. This old man is all by himself. So the South is out trying to say, hey, look, we're the good guys. But then something happens that shocks both the North and the South. And that was John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry. Now, John Brown, as you remember, last we talked about him, uh, he was in Kansas, and he had killed those five people near Pottawatomie Creek. 
Well, he really felt convicted that God was telling him that he wanted John Brown to lead a, a slave uprising. And so he traveled to the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Where he and a group uh, first um, took a, stopped a rail, railroad that was going to go to Harper's Ferry. And they basically hijacked the railroad, took it over, <clears throat> and forced the engineer to drive them into uh, Harper's Ferry, the arsenal there. And they got out and they let the engineer go, but they didn't cut like any of the telegraph cables uh, at the depot right before uh, the arsenal. So the engineer was able to get off, tell um, Washington, D.C. what the heck was going on. So Washington, D.C. goes to one of their top ranking uh, military officials, Robert E. Lee, and tells him to get an army and go down and quash this rebellion that had taken over Harper's Ferry Arsenal. And John Brown goes in there, he takes the thing over, and the slaves that were supposed to take part in this uprising weren't there. Nobody had told them. So he finds himself, uh, in the end, kind of surrounded in this one storehouse that uh, became known as John Brown's Fort. And holds out, but he's killed. And this attack is totally frightening to the South. Because it shows, it they believed, it showed them that the North was willing to break any law to fight against slavery. Ready for the next slide? Now this is when a book comes out called The Impending Crisis of the South by Henry Rowan Helper. Now, if this was a regular class, I'd do to you what I do with my class. I'd say, okay, two of my students are gonna own convenience stores. One of y'all is going to use slaves. The other one is going to have to pay and I'll say, what's minimum wage? And they might say, seven twenty-five an hour. I say, okay, I tell you what, you have to pay eight bucks an hour. So who wants to have the convenience store owned by slaves? And of course, nobody raises their hand. So usually I'll pick somebody uh, and they'll say, okay. And then I'll, uh, another student, I'll say, who wants the other convenience store where you only pay eight bucks an hour? Somebody will raise their hand and I'll say, okay. I'll say, all right, guys, which of these two stores is the owner going to make more money? At the one where you have to pay your workers eight bucks an hour or where you don't have to pay your workers anything? And most of the students in the class will raise their hand for, oh, well, we don't have to pay our workers anything. I'll say, okay. And then I'll go to the um, one who has slaves and I'll say, uh, who pays for the housing for your employees? Oh, that's right, you do. Then I'll look at the other guy who has to pay his workers eight bucks an hour. Who has to pay for their housing? Oh, that's right, they do. Then I go back to the other, who pays to feed them? Oh, that's right, you do. Then I go to the um, eight buck an hour store and I'll say, and who pays for their food with you? He's like, hey, I pay him eight bucks an hour. Then I go to the other, who pays for their health care, their dental, their electricity, their gas, their transfer? And of course, the slave owner has to pay for all that stuff. The free market, he only has to pay eight bucks an hour. In the impending crisis of the South, 
by Henry Rowan Helper. He points out with charts and statistics and everything how slavery in the South is bad. Now guys, I wish I could say that he, he would say it was bad for the slaves. He doesn't really care about the slaves. Uh, who he cared about was the poor whites. He was like, look, slavery is keeping poverty down because it's locking all that money, all that wealth into a fixed system. And um, basically, uh, he said that abolishing slavery would improve economic conditions in the South and allow the plain folk to share in prosperity. And even though it was hated in the South, Northerners distributed it wisely, even though it was written by a Southern racist. And it sold more than 500 copies every day. Ready for the next line? The Divided Nation. Okay, next slide. The Dominance of Regionalism. By the 1860s, the Democratic Party split over the issue of slavery in the territory. Northern Democrats, they nominated Douglas for president on a platform of popular sovereignty in the territories. And you know, popular sovereignty gives them a choice. Well, when he wins the nomination, disgusted Southerners walk out of the convention These Southern Democrats, they nominate Vice President John C. Breckinridge. And they demanded on his platform there be a federal protection for slavery in the territories. And protection for slavery where it existed. The Constitutional Party, they basically uh, split off to try to force an election into the House of Representatives. They nominate Bell. Ready for the next slide? Well, what about the Republicans? The Republicans, they nominate uh, Abraham Lincoln, even though the candidate they wanted was William Seward, because he was a much uh, more ardent abolitionist. However, uh, Seward had a campaign manager, Thurlow Weed, who was a little bit tricky with the money and was seen as untrustworthy. So they went with Abraham Lincoln. And basically this party opposed the extension of slavery into the territories. What did it support? It supported higher tariffs, which the North would have loved because that would have made foreign goods that much more expensive. They supported internal improvements, like the building of more roads, canals, railroads, which the West and the North would have liked. And they wanted land legislation for the West, basically to keep the land cheap, which the West would have liked. And we get to the election of 1860. 
In this election, the Republicans really emphasized the slavery issue? And they also played on corruption within the Democratic Party? Bless his heart, Douglas attempted to save the Union by uniting the moderate Democrats and the Constitutional Unionists. That totally fails. And the South totally is panicked at the prospect of a Republican victory. You start having these rumors of slave uprisings. Should Lincoln win that sweep through the South? And well, when the smoke clears, the Republican victory was the first time the president was elected by a single region. I mean, he won all the northern states, including California and Oregon, giving him 180 electoral votes, even though he only carried 40% of the popular vote. Douglas, he only wins Missouri. Bell won in Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and Texas. You can see Breckenridge wept through the Deep South, Maryland. Ready for the next slide? Well, you start to have the first wave of session, which mushroomed in the Deep South after the Republican victory. South Carolina led the way in 1860, with Mississippi, uh, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana getting out by January of 1861. And I believe Texas also fell in February and joined the Confederacy. Now this is a despite the fact that uh, Crittenden, John J. Crittenden is running around. He's a senator from Kentucky. He introduced several proposals to Senate in December of 1860, suggesting, hey, hey, let's just go back to the Missouri Compromise. Everybody was happy then. Let's just go back to the Missouri Compromise and we'll forbid slavery above the line. And we'll offer compensation to slave owners who weren't able to retrieve their slaves. Now, of course, because this meant that slavery would be expanded, Abraham Lincoln's totally against this. And when the Confederacy is established, they write their own constitution where uh, protective tariffs were passed. No, tariffs were passed but protective tariffs were made illegal. There would be no funding of internal improvements. And curiously, the Confederate Constitution banned slave importation. Now, why did they do that? Well, they probably did that because they wanted to get on the good side with Britain. 
because if they could get Britain's support, then they'd be able to put up a real fight against the North. Ready to go to the next slide? Responses to disunion. Well, guys, this is a shocker. I mean, people don't know how to respond to this thing. I mean, some people in the South still favored compromise. And they tried to have a peace conference in February of 1861 but it totally fails because division in the South prevented union. Jefferson Davis became the president of the Confederacy and he basically advised his citizens not to rock the boat. Meanwhile, what is President Buchanan, who's the lame duck president, what does he do? He does absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, Lincoln, who knows that he's going to have to hit the road running once he does become president, he included all the major figures in the Republican Party in his cabinet. to kind of help forge unity. I mean, he even picked men who had supported his rivals so that the Republican Party would be unified. The nation dissolved. All right, at uh, Lincoln's uh, inaugural address, he totally rejected session and slavery's expansion, but he promised that he wasn't going to interfere with slavery where it was. Now, why did Lincoln do that? Because, guys, that's kind of like an olive branch, okay? Mm Fights haven't really started out yet. But secessionists claim this speech as a declaration of war. In South Carolina, all federal troops in Charleston were moved to Fort Sumner, a fort in the middle of the harbor. And in this harbor, the people needed supplies. But on January 3rd, 1861, shore batteries fire on the ship Star of the West that was sending supplies down, preventing it from uh, landing. They also steal a ship, the Marion, and converted into a man of war. But Buchanan did nothing. Well, now those troops at Fort Sumter are getting low on supplies. So, Lincoln takes office, and the way he deals with this tricky situation is he tells everybody, everybody, that he is going to be sending an unarmed ship convoy that's just carrying supplies, that's it, down to South Carolina. So everybody knows that there's nothing but food 
and other supplies on those ships. <coughs> well, what is South Carolina going to do? Well, they try to avoid the whole thing by, on April 12th, 1861, the Confederate States of America, General P.G.T. Beauregard, demands the fort surrender. Because if the fort surrenders, then the Confederacy won't have to open on the supply ship. Well, does that work? No, because the soldiers in the garrison know that they're going to be resupplied soon. Ready for the next line? So, on the morning that the sh supply ship is supposed to be arriving later that day, the Confederates don't want to have to fire on the supply ships, so they open fire on the fort. And the fort uh, lasts I think for one day and the, the barrage of cannon is brutal and they finally surrender and on this one battle that began one of America's bloodiest wars there were no casualties on either side. Ready for the next slide? Well, of course. Uh, well, of course. Uh, using tales like of uh, one guy who the uh, the flagpole cracks and half of it falls down. He climbs up and repairs the flagpole in the middle of the battle, so the flag will remain flying. And through stories like that. Basically, they, uh, Lincoln puts out a call for 75,000 volunteers to go and fight against the Confederacy. Well, the Northern call for troops choosing sides in Virginia basically prompts a second round of secession in the south with Virginia leading the way now of course this is what Virginia used to look like and a lot of guys over here in West Virginia that are up in the mountains that really don't have the same kind of society or cash crops that the rest of Virginia does, they seed from the rest of Virginia and they apply for statehood to the United States as West Virginia, which is accepted. Abraham Lincoln then goes to the most able soldier in the North. I mean, this guy was an incredible leader of men, Robert E. Lee. And says, Robert E. Lee, uh, fulfill your life's dream. Become my uh, the general over all my armies. And Lee says no and he resigns because he can't fight against he doesn't want to fight against fellow Virginians and he does accept the position of the general the leader of the uh, Northern Army of Virginia
Well, after Virginia, you have Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee. They follow Virginia into joining the Confederacy. But curiously, in Tennessee, Eastern Tennesseans tried to break away from the rest of Tennessee, just like West Virginia had done, but they were unable to do so. Ready to go to the next line? Well, basically you had the border states remain. What side are they gonna pick? Like Maryland, Maryland had slavery in it. And Lincoln could not afford for Maryland to cede from the Union. Why? Because if Maryland had ceded, then the capital, Washington DC, would be surrounded by Confederate territory. So basically he goes in, totally breaks due process, going out arresting and rounding up sessionists, closing down meetings without any legal right to do so. But he is able to keep Maryland in the Union. In Kentucky, just like in Tennessee, the legislator voted to stay neutral but fighting broke out between Sessionists and Unionists. And in Missouri, even though fighting and rioting occurred, the Unionists were able to hold on to the state and keep it in the North. Okay, so our next lecture is going to be about the Civil War. Alrighty.